Hello, everyone. I'm Neha D'Souza. I'm an oncologist and hematologist with Epic Care. Um, uh, my office locations are in Castro Valley, Hayward, San Leandro. Um, I completed my residency at Mount Sinai, St. Luke's, and Mount Sinai West in New York City, and my fellowship at NYU Winthrop in New York as well. Um, my Professional interests span through a spectrum of breast, GI, GU, lung cancers, benign, and malignant hematology. Uh, I've been interested in medical oncology since I was a medical student, uh, and I did my rotations at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. And the medicine of and the science of oncology is very interesting to me. And these uh, cancer patients just go through a roller coaster of a journey. So just helping them navigate through the complex diagnosis and treatment is something that's very rewarding to me. Uh, these are the disclosures. So the objectives for um, today's talk are providing guidance on interpreting, uh, interpretation of a complete blood count clarifying the workup to be done prior to referring to a hematologist and understanding the standard workup to be done on a suspected malignancy. So let's start with a case scenario uh, and please feel free uh, to interrupt me with any questions along the talk as they come up. So this is a 48, 44 year old female. She presents with two months of fatigue her uh, CBC hemogram is shown. Um, what is the differential and what questions would you ask? So this is her most recent CBC here. We can see it's from October of 2020. Um, and the other one is from April of 2020. What stands out here is that her hemoglobin is on the lower side. And what further stands out is her MCV is 69 and 67. The lower limit of normal is usually 80, so the MCV is low, and the RDW is high in both situations as well. So this uh, is suggestive of a microcytic anemia, and um, since she is 44, year, 44 years old in the reproductive age group, um, the number one differential would be iron deficiency anemia from um, heavy menstrual bleeding. And we see a ton of patients coming in for this so uh, the treatment for that is getting to the root of the problem, uh, fixing the high uh, you know, menstrual blood flow. Uh, we refer them to GYN. And of course, iron supplementation. So oral iron is initially the first line. And then beyond that, if they're not able to tolerate it, um, then we move to IV iron, which we do in our infusion center, which brings the level back up immediately and holds for a long time as well. So evaluation of um, a red blood cell count, these are the parameters we look at. Hemoglobin is basically a measure of the amount of oxygen carrying protein in the blood. Hematocrit is a percentage of the similar uh, hemoglobin in the blood. The red blood cell indices that we look at are um, the RDW, MCV, and the other big one I would say is the reticulocyte count. So RDW is um, basically a variation in the size of the RBC. So if there is, there's like some big cells, some small cells, and this number goes up, it's seen more with iron deficiency anemia like in our patient scenario. Um, MCV is a measure of the size of the RBC. Um, and I'll, I'll go into more detail on that in a little bit. And the reticulocyte count is basically a measurement of the young blood cells in the blood, which are the bigger ones. And that goes up more when there's more production, more young cells are coming out of the bone marrow. <clears throat> so, uh, so this is uh, a table with uh, the causes of low hemoglobin versus high hemoglobin. So the high hemoglobin here is seen, um, it's called polycythemia. It can be seen in dehydration, which is basically uh, the blood becomes hemoconcentrated and it's like an artificial increase in the hemoglobin. And once you hydrate these patients, the, the, the count comes back to normal. Pulmonary diseases can also cause polycythemia. This is basically uh, when 
a patient is subjected to hypoxia, uh, the, as a defense mechanism, the erythropoietin secretion from the kidneys increases. And then as a result, the hemoglobin goes up to compensate for the low oxygen because of the pulmonary disease. Uh, kidney and liver tumors, uh, which are erythrocyte secreting tumors, erythropoietin secreting tumors, um, are also, also lead to polycythemia. Um, smoking is actually a really big one. So that's kind of uh, a diagnosis of exclusion. If the patient says you're smoking and everything else is negative, we attribute it to that and does it improve with the cessation of smoking. And then the last one, uh, which is really the concerning one for us, is if they have a myeloproliferative disorder. So when patients are referred to us for polycythemia, we check for that if there's a suspicion. And basically, in that situation, the bone marrow is making too much of the hemoglobin because of a mutation in the JAK2 or BCRABL, and that's something that we check for. Um, a low hemoglobin uh, is seen in different scenarios. So the three big ones would be if the body is not making enough. So that would be if there's a deficiency here in B12, folate, or iron or if the body is making enough, but it's getting destroyed by the body in the case of hemolytic anemias. And then finally, um, if, any, if there are any bone marrow conditions, and if there's also, a, a, you know, the body's making it, it's not getting destroyed, but it's getting lost in the form of bleeding. So acute bleeds and chronic bleeds can both lead to anemia. Uh, the acute bleeds would be more of like an acute GI bleed, an ulcer, um, a bleeding vessel, variceal bleeding in alcoholics. And then a slow bleed would be more from gastritis or patients who are on anticoagulation chronically have slow bleeds. Uh, so this is hemolytic anemia here. The, uh, the combination of things we see there are anemia, elevated LDH, low haptoglobin, elevated bilirubin. When we have these four things uh, together, we think of hemolytic anemia. This can be further two, divided into two broad types. One is the autoimmune hemolytic anemia. In this situation, the DAT, a direct antibody test, is something that we send out. And when that comes back positive, it's more suggestive of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. The treatment for that is mostly <clears throat> steroids. The other broad type of hemolytic anemia is a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. And in this situation, um, we'll see schistocytes in the peripheral smear. And this is what it looks like. They're little ruptured red blood cells, uh, sickle-shaped, and they rupture as they're shored through the little vessels of the, of, uh, within the body. So, um, another, so an important parameter to look at when we look at the CBC, and especially in anemia patients, uh, is the MCV. So as I mentioned earlier, this is the size of the red cell. So if it's a low MCV, the si it's usually less than 80. If it's a high MCV, that would be a count more than 100. So the normal range is 80 to 100. So um, low MCV is called microcytosis, and that is seen in iron deficiency anemia and thalassemia. Um, so you can see a picture here. If you have, this is a normal blood smear. So the normal RBCs are biconcave discs and they have the central pallor. But if you have a microchromic, hypo, uh, microcytic hypochromic anemia, then the central pallor, where the hypochromic part, it's increased as in this cell. And then uh, this is seen in iron deficiency anemia. And sometimes you will also see target cells like in these other cells here with this little dot in the center that's more seen in thalassemia. A uh, high MCV uh, with MCV more than 100 is called macrocytosis. Um, it's seen in B12 and folate deficiencies. Um, and so here's a cell with macrocytic hyperchromic anemia. Hyperchromic means the central pallor that is seen in normal cells, like on this slide is less here and the cells of the size, the size of the cells are larger. Um, another clue here uh, on the peripheral smear with folate and B12 deficiency is hypersegmented neutrophils. So if you look at this neutrophil here, it has a ton of lobes. So anything more than five lobes is, uh, is classified as hypersegmented. And this is also uh, a clue that, you know, there's some underlying B12 or folate deficiency going on. 
Um, other causes of mac macrocytosis are myelodysplastic syndrome. In myelodysplastic syndrome, the peripheral smear may have like a pelga Hewitt cells, which is like, looks like a pair of sunglasses, two lobes. Hypothyroidism um, is another cause of macrocytosis. Medications like methotrexate, anticonvulsants can cause macrocytosis. And finally, um, and this is something that's pretty common to alcohol abuse and liver disease is a scenario where macrocytosis is visible. <clears throat> um, so I touched on this a little bit. Uh, the RDW is another parameter that we should always keep our eye on. It's the red RBC distribution width. And basically, um, it's, it indicates a mixed population of small and large RBCs. So if there are a lot of immature, small RB, uh, immature large RBCs and normal mature small RBCs, then the RDW count will be up. And that's something that is increased in iron deficiency anemia and pernicious anemia, which is essentially B12 deficiency, as there's a lot of new cells, that's, uh, uh, there's a lot of variation new cells and old cells. Um, so this is helpful to, di uh, to distinguish between um, iron deficiency anemia and thalassemia. So both iron deficiency and thalassemia will both have small microcytic cells, but RDW is increased only in the iron deficiency and not in the thalassemia. Reticulocyte count is a very important test for us to get in the anemia workup. Reticulocytes are basically uh, the small red cells. They're large, uh, not small, but uh, they're the uh, young red cells and they're actually the opposite. They're really large in size. They're larger than the regular mature RBCs. So if the reticulocyte count is up, that means a lot of new cells are being formed and the bone marrow is hyper proliferating and making a lot of cells. So this is seen in the case of peripheral bleeding because the body is trying to compensate for the loss of blood um, and hemolysis, same similar kind of uh, thought process behind that um, on iron supplementation for iron deficiency anemia. The low reticulocyte count is seen when um, there's problem with proliferation, so it's a hypoproliferative state. So the nutrients required to make the red cells are deficient. So iron deficiency, B12 deficiency, folate deficiency, all these three will cause hypoproliferative low reticulocyte count. But the same iron deficiency can produce as uh, can uh, present as hyperproliferative with a high reticulocyte count if you are actively supplementing with iron deficiency. So that's some with iron, IV, PO, whatever it may be. So that's something to be mindful of. Uh, this is a slide on evaluation of white blood cells. There are several different types. For the most part, they all help with immune. Uh, boosting the immunity of the body. Neutrophils, uh, more with um, bacterial infections, eosinophils against parasites, basophils help with the inflammatory responses. Monocytes help with immune surveillance as well. B cells are the ones who produce the antibodies, like um, all the anti, the G, A, M, D, E. Um, and the T cells are responsible for um, T lymphocytes for cellular immune response so they are the cytotoxic T cells that directly go and kill uh, you know, the bacteria. Um, so this is versus leukocytosis. So when the white blood cell count is low and is less than normal, that is termed as leukopenia. So leukopenia can be seen, we get this consult all the time. You know, uh, we need to rule out autoimmune uh, etiologies of leukopenia. Uh, any infection underlying sepsis can cause uh, leukopenia. Myelophysis can also cause leukopenia. And this is basically what this means is there's infiltration of the bone marrow with either tumor or some sort of infection like TB or some sort of inflammatory condition, sarcoid, all of this, uh, if there's infiltration of the bone marrow, it suppresses the normal bone marrow contents in the white cells coming out of the bone marrow and there's leukopenia there. There's also myelodysplasia that can cause leukopenia. So once, when we get this consult, once all of these are excluded, 
that's when we attribute it to just a physiologic ethnic leukopenia. We call it a benign ethnic neutropenia. It's something we just follow. And if uh, the counts go down and the patient is also having a side effect from the low counts, which would mean infections, fevers, in that situation, we would replace them with growth factors to bring up the counts. But if that's not the case and you know they're having low counts, but no infections or anything like that, asymptomatic, we just watch them because that's their physiologic normal and their body is able to fight infections despite that count. Um, leukocytosis, which is an increase in WBC. Um, this, can, this is seen in infections, um, inflammation, and in stress. So, and this is a temporary uh, scenario. Once the inflammation, the infection, and stress um, is relieved or treated, it's passed, the count comes down. It's just a temporary uh, increase. Um, what we need to worry about with lymphocyte leukocytosis, though, is the possibility of having a lymphoproliferative or a myeloproliferative disease, and I'm going to go into that in a little more detail. Any questions so far? Um, Dr. De Sasa, there was a question from Veronica Fern, and she yes. can repeat the RDW distinguish between IDA and thalassemias, and forgive me for pronouncing that wrong. Thalassemia, yeah. yeah. Oh, she wanted, you want me to repeat how it dis distinguishes the two? Um, she just asked, can you repeat the RDW distinguish? Yes, of course, I'm happy to repeat it. So RDW is basically as a variation in the cell size. So uh, that's more in the case of iron deficiency anemia. So iron deficiency will have an increase in the RDW, but um, thalassemia will not. So both of them will have the, maybe a little bit of anemia in common, definitely microcytosis in common, but the iron deficiency will have a high RDW um, and the thalassemia will not. Does that answer the question? her answer that in the chat box because I, I <laughs> okay should I open the chat box uh, uh, Steve Schiff said yes it answers the question okay um, okay any other questions okay so I'm gonna move on then um, so, oh, actually, I guess my screen here is probably blocking. Okay. Um, so leukemia um, uh, is something that we see and the acute leukemics are, uh, they're a medical emergency. Leukemia basically is a cancer of the hem hematopoietic stem cells. They can be lymphoproliferative or myeloproliferative. Um, they can be acute or chronic. So the acute leukemias um, present with big cells like this one in the picture. Um, they will have cytopenias, definitely um, low platelets. Um, they'll present with, with symptoms of the low platelets, which would be uh, bleeding from the low platelets, uh, infections from the abnormal white cell counts, anemia. They'll have B symptoms, a lot of fatigue, um, and sometimes they'll have a high white count too. In that situation, they may require a pharesis to, re to remove the very high uh, big leukemic cells to improve the symptoms. The chronic ones uh, present very differently. So they have these tiny mature lymphocytes here. This is a CLL cell, a CLL slide. Um, these never cause symptoms of vaso-occlusion from very high counts. So even if they're very high counts, as long as they're not causing symptoms, uh, which would be B symptoms, fever, night sweats, weight loss, fatigue, or symptoms from cytopenias, um, we don't treat them. Or if they have a rapid doubling time. Um, but the acute leukemias do require uh, to be admitted in patient for induction chemotherapy. 
Lymphomas are a cancer, are a malignancy of the lymphatic system. Their broad uh, criteria, uh, uh, classification is Hodgkin's versus non-Hodgkin's. The presentation is usually lymphadenopathy and B-type symptoms. So again, fevers, weight loss, night sweats, um, and they are treated based on the histology. So here too, um, there are some acute ones that need to be treated and some that can just be watched. So if it's um, a lymphoma, like a diffuse large B cell, uh, a large cell aggressive one, some of them may present with uh, aggressive symptoms and they need to be admitted for inpatient chemotherapy. Um, this is just going over uh, the type of uh, white cells again, so neutrophilia. Um, here are the neutrophils, they are multi-lobulated uh, cells. So the nucleus, we can see there's several lobes. Um, they have, they, they are accompanied, they usually occur when there's inflammation, bacterial infection. Another big one here is CML. So in CML, uh, they'll have different uh, immature types of neutrophils and it requires targeted therapy by us to bring those counts down uh, and to prevent them to, uh, from becoming an acute leukemia. Um, basophilia, uh, you know, sometimes if it's a, usually uh, it, it's nothing, but there are times if there's a very high basophilia and it's persistent, it may be a clue to a brewing underlying leukemia. So this is how the basophil looks like. There are a lot of blue granules in the cytoplasm. Um, eosinophilia is seen in parasite infections, in allergies, asthma. Um, the eosinophils, you can see them here. They are very different from the rest of the cells. They have red granules in the cytoplasm. Uh, monocytosis um, is seen in bacterial infections, TB, malaria, also CMML, which is a kind of leukemia. Um, and these cells, the monocytes are large cells and they have like a bilobed um, kind of uh, nucleus, kidney shaped nucleus like this cell over here is characteristic. Lymphocytes are increased in viral infections. They're increased in tuberculosis and in CLL and lymphoma. And these are smaller cells than the monocyte, monocytes. Any questions so far? And this is Steve Schiff. I was just checking in <clears throat> about CLL in particular. Yes. Uh, I've had a patient where they would kind of go back and forth between primary care and Hemonc, and I'm really unclear as to the direction of, from the primary care perspective of when they get booted back to primary care, how often um, they should come back to Hemonc, and what should be uh, the primary care perspective on following up with that patient. And if it makes sense to answer this question later, I'm fine with that, but I saw that it came up. No, this is a very good question. I'm happy to answer it. So CLL is a very indolent um, leukemia. Some people, you know, they'll go their entire lives and never have any symptoms from it. Um, but it is something that needs to be monitored because once uh, it causes symptoms or has a rapid doubling time, the counts are increasing really fast in six months. They can have uh, cytopenias, autoimmune side effects from it. So they need to be monitored. I would say every um, three to six months, their levels need to be checked to make sure they're not having symptoms or they're not having rapid increase in the counts because in those situations, they would require to have treatment initiated. Thanks. Sure. I'm gonna get into a little bit more detail of that in my next slides too. Um, so uh, this is a, another case scenario, 55 year old male anthropology professor feeling well um, here in the clinic. Uh, this is a CBC. What is the differential and what questions would you ask? So what stands out here in this um, hemogram is the white count. It is really high, 63.3. And then if we look at the, you know, which of the subtypes of the white cells are causing that, it's the lymphocytes. It's up to 83, 86%. Um, so that, this is a situation of CLL. 
So CLL is the most common leukemia um, in America. It's a very important one for primary carers to know about. The incidence is three in every 100,000, and it's a disease of the elderly. Um, about 75% of the patients are over 65, and men are affected more than women. So how will these patients present? Uh, they have asymptomatic leukocytosis, um, just like uh, in our case scenario. They may or may not have lymphadenopathy. Um, they may have bone marrow failure, meaning decrease in the uh, hemoglobin, in the neutrophil count, in the platelets, because the bone marrow is so crowded with the uh, CLL cells, the other cells are suppressed. They can also have repeated infections if the white cells, uh, the neutrophils are suppressed. And then they may have autoimmune side effects like autoimmune hemolytic anemia and ITP. Yeah, and as I was explaining, uh, these patients need to be monitored. Um, they don't need to be treated from the get-go, but if they have symptoms of cytopenia, if they have a very rapid doubling time, we anticipate that symptoms will come. Or if they have sometimes bulky lymphadenopathy causing pressure symptoms, these are the situations where we go ahead and treat them. So uh, moving on to evaluation of the platelet count. Um, platelets uh, range from 140,000 to 450,000. Um, decrease in platelets uh, is called thrombocytopenia. Um, and increase in platelets is thrombocytosis. Um, so thrombocytosis uh, can be seen in a reactive setting from an infection or inflammation or stress. So inpatient, we see a lot of patients who are admitted with an infection and sepsis who have high counts. Iron deficiency is actually a really common reason for thrombocytosis. We get this consult all the time. And so again, this would be in like a young menstruating uh, woman. She would come in and her, her her MCV will be low, hemoglobin will may or may not be low, um, but her thrombocytosis will be present. So as soon as we replete the iron in these patients, automatically the platelet count comes down. Uh, myeloproliferative disease is the one we always try to rule out. So essential thrombocytosis, um, polycythemia vera, and CML. So when thrombocytosis uh, you know, consults come to us, we check for JAK2 and uh, BCR, ABL to rule out these conditions. Um, what is this? One second. Yeah, so here we can see the slide with the thrombocytosis. A ton, these little dots there are all the platelets and there's a lot of them in this slide. And it's all because of the increased number of platelets present in the circulation. Thrombocytopenia is a decrease in platelet count. It can also be seen in infections, usually viral and atypical infections. Uh, chemotherapy can cause bone marrow suppression with all the cell lines go down and platelets are definitely one of them. Liver disease uh, and cirrhosis can cause thrombocytopenia as well um, because the protein uh, that is made, that helps in the synthesis of the platelets is made in the liver. So uh, if the liver is not functioning well, the platelets are not synthesized adequately. And then low platelets can also be seen in MDS, myelophysis. Like I said, it, myelophysis again is infiltration of the bone marrow by cancer or infection or some inflammatory condition. And autoimmune uh, is you know, a big one that we see as well. Autoimmune causes of decreased platelets. Um, so this is the next case scenario. Any questions so far? Okay, so I'll move on to the case scenario. You can always ask me later if something does come up. So this is a 72-year-old retired male. He comes to the clinic, feels well. This is his CBC. So what's the differential? What questions would you ask? So everything here looks fine, just a slight decrease in the platelet count. So this is likely a chronic ITP, which is a diagnosis of exclusion. So basically, you know, we rule out all of these other 
causes of uh, thrombocytopenia, and then we come to the ITP diagnosis. So ITP is immune thrombocytopenic purpura. Um, the symptoms are low platelets. They may have petechiae, like little non-blanching red spots in their skin. They may have bleeding from gums. Otherwise, uh, they, they, do, they, they do well. Um, it may be acute versus chronic. Acute is if it's presented within six months. This is a new change of drop in platelets within six months. Chronic is more than six months. Um, in children, it's often self-limiting, but in adults, uh, the situation when we want to treat them is when they're approaching 30. So um, even though the lower limit of platelet count is 140, 150, we only treat them when they're close to 30. And the reason for that is that spontaneous bleeding and any sort of you know, negative consequence from a low platelet only occurs for platelet count less than 10. So our cutoff for treating is close to 30, but we definitely need to monitor these patients to make sure we trend out their platelet count and we know that they're not going in a downward direction. And you know, if they are, we need to start seeing them more frequently because treatment needs to be initiated at platelet counts close to 30. The usual treatments are prednisone and IVIG um, for the initial, uh, initial presentation. Uh, so here's a picture of... Uh, an ITP situation, we can see there are very few platelets, which is, so there is a platelet, but it's like not as many of them. And they also have these giant platelets. Any questions on ITP? Okay, I'll move on then. Um, uh, the next uh, entity here is TTP. This is a medical emergency. Um, we have to be suspicious of TTP if there are low platelets, if there's a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, which basically means signs of hemolysis, high LDH, low haptoglobin, um, and anemia, falling hemoglobin. Also, the peripheral smear will have uh, schistocytes, like the ones I had shown in the previous picture, the sickle-shaped uh, broken RBCs. Um, and they will have clinical features of bruising, bleeding, neurological symptoms. So they can have confusion, headaches, change in mental status, seizures, fevers. Um, and they may also have uh, a decreasing kidney function. So the laboratory findings, like I mentioned, were low platelets, low hemoglobin, hemolysis parameters will be positive. Uh, the direct uh, DAT, direct thrombin test, direct antiglobin test will be negative because it's not an autoimmune condition. It's a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. Bilirubins will be high. So this is treated with uh, emergent plasmapheresis. Um, and this has a 90% mortality, if not phoresed in time. So this is something that's important to recognize. I do think it's a little more of uh, inpatient uh, medicine though, not so much of outpatient, um, but this is, this is definitely something that's important that we always uh, wanna rule out. Um, the other microangiopathic hemolytic anemia is HUS, which is hemolytic uremic syndrome. There's a lot of overlap between HUS and TTP. You know, they both cause thrombocytopenia. They're both hemolytic anemias. They can both cause renal involvement. They can both have CNS involvement. But the big difference between the two is HUS will have like a diarrhea syndrome here. So, um, so it'll have like a diarrhea, bloody diarrhea, and the sugar toxin will be positive in the stool cultures. That is the typical HUS. And the treatment for that is just, it's self-limiting. Um, but the alternative to that is if there's no diarrhea, you can also have an atypical hemolytic uh, uremic syndrome. It's very difficult to distinguish from TTP. Um, and that's caused by complement problems and it's treated by an agent called echolizumab. Uh, Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is something that we get a lot of consults on. This is more inpatient, again, like TTP more than outpatient. Here, what happens is the patient is exposed to heparin, and then their platelet counts drop. 
So the reasons where uh, the situations where it's a high probability is suspected that this is what's going on is if the platelet count has dropped to 50%, if it's five to 10 days of exposure of uh, the heparin, and if there's also associated thrombosis. And the treatment of this is to stop the heparin. And depending on the level of suspicion, uh, if it's intermediate or high probability, we also add on um, non-heparin anticoagulant like a gatroban or bevilrudin. Uh, finally, um, any questions so far on TTP or um, HUS or HIT? Chat box from Mimi Ogawa, and she says, you may get to this later, but if not, can you address MCH and MCHC? Occasionally, there is isolated low MCH, MCHC, no HGB, and ferritin are normal. How do we interpret or manage that? Okay, let me go back to the slide where I have that. Mm. So usually um, the MCHC, I would say one situation where we look at it and it's high is in uh, hereditary spherocytosis, which is where the hemoglobin is really concentrated. But usually we don't look at MCH, MCHC as much. We get the majority of our clinical information from the MCV, the RDW, the reticulocyte count. So I would say if everything else is normal and just one of these two is a slightly elevated, we don't really read into much of it unless, the, like I said, the MCHC is high. Um, and then if it's hereditary spherocytosis, the cell size will be really small. There will be hemolysis parameters that will be positive, which is like high LDH, low haptoglobin, elevated bilirubins. But otherwise, we do see normal variants on these two that we don't really you know, uh, add a lot of additional work up for. Sorry. OK. And this is my final slide. Um, I wanted to discuss the workup on detecting a new mass. So when a new mass is identified, either by the patient having self-palpated a mass or by the provider having palpated it on an annual physical, um, blood work needs to be obtained. So CBC, CMP, LDH, uric acid, coags, appropriate tumor markers. Um, I would say, though, as soon as the mass is identified, I would recommend referring to oncology um, so that nothing is missed. But if in case you do want to send out the workup yourself, this is some guidance on what to send out. Um, after the blood tests are obtained, uh, initial uh, imaging would be a full uh, scan of the body, CT, chest, abdomen, pelvis, or a PET CT. If there are neurological symptoms, confusion, and stuff like that, also a brain MRI. Then based on this imaging, we decide what site to biopsy, not just the site that's palpated, but the most accessible site. So sometimes like we prefer, we like liver biopsies, bone biopsies, because the metastatic site is what's preferred uh, for solid tumors, not the primary site of origin. Um, and if a lymphoma is suspected, like if there's a, a swollen lymph node in the neck or in the axilla or something like that, it's really important to send an excisional biopsy that is done by surgery. We sometimes get uh, core biopsies or a FNA biopsies, which is fine needle aspiration. They just put in a needle and they take out a sample. We need the entire lymph node to be removed because for diagnosis by pathology or for lymphoma, they need to look at the architecture of the entire lymph node to be able to say exactly which subtype of lymphoma it is. So that's something um, that's important for everybody to know. But like I said, we're happy to you know, do the workup ourselves. Just refer the patient over as soon as a new mass is identified by yourself or the patient, um, and we can finish the rest of it, of the workup. Um, that's, uh, with that, I conclude my presentation, and I'll open up for questions. Great. And so you could either type your questions in the chat box. And Dr. DeSausa, can you see the questions? In yeah, the let me get out of the screen. And go to my Zoom. And if some of you 
don't, oh, I would like to unmute yourselves and you find that you can't, just um, send me a message and I will unmute you and you could ask the question. Oh, here we go. Mute. Okay. So start from the top. So the first question here is leukocytosis, leukopenias, what's high, what's low, what point do you refer, when do you repeat, and how long between repeat checks? So anything above or below the normal limits are high or low. Different labs are different, so usually it's like four to 11, but different labs are different. It's not always those numbers, they're not hard and fast. Um, anything high or low needs to be worked up for. Uh, you know, if there's an infection or if there's an underlying uh, malignancy that's brewing. And then depending on what we find, uh, we have to keep monitoring it. So if, uh, for instance, it's CLL, you know, we know that the leukocytosis is because of lymphocytosis and there's CLL lymphocytes circulating, I would say at least every four to six months we have to follow them. But if it's just like something, uh, you know, everything we've ruled out and it's just something we're monitoring to make sure they don't suddenly increase and we need to recheck uh, for a malignancy workup, and that would be like every six months or so. Six months to a year even if everything is stable, asymptomatic. And the other two questions actually in the group I already answered from the chat. Any other questions that anybody else has that I can help answer? Anything you're seeing with your patients? Oh, there we go. We got something from Steve Schiff in there. Okay. So the question is, if we'd like to get an iron infusion for a patient, do they need to go through a consult or direct to the infusion center? Um, so I do think they need to come in for a consult um, and see us so that we can get the full uh, you know, iron panel on them. Sometimes the reason is, say, uh, the iron deficiency is just mild. We would definitely encourage oral iron. Uh, but if it's a severe deficiency and they're symptomatic, and say they've tried oral iron in the past, it hasn't worked, then we need to default to IV iron. So to make that decision, we need to see them and do a consult and make sure you know, we're giving them the best uh, option that they have. Thanks, I'm, I'm also curious is that um, how quickly, let's say, you know, we've got someone who's dropping their hemoglobin, let's say they have uh, menorrhagia, let's say they actually ended up getting, uh, going to the ED and they slowly are winding down and we see that they, we've done their iron studies and their uh, iron studies show that indeed uh, they're deficient um, and we want to still get that infusion. How quickly can that happen and what's the recommendation of the best route for making that, making that happen? I feel like that sometimes I, we get fairly tripped up in having a smooth um, transition over to either hematology or to the infusion center. Okay, so um, usually when we order infusions in our infusion center, I would say the maximum is about two weeks because it takes time to you know get insurance approval and make sure the patients don't you know uh, are aware of what the coverage and stuff is. But if it's an emergent situation, we can order something within three days. Great. And I guess a follow-up to that is um, many of our patients, many folks don't really tolerate uh, iron, yes. uh, iron supplements that well, even for the liquid, and I'm blanking on the name of that right now, um, with the high sugar content. Um, mm -hmm. Any other recommendations aside from diet, pills, and the liquid replacements? Or, or even I, I, best I think we covered everything. I think it's usually the oral, the pills, or it's the liquid, 
or definitely high diet, like you said, high iron food. And then outside of that is IV iron. The IV iron works really well. Um, it tanks up their level. And you know, even if they're actively having heavy menstrual bleeding, like for three, four months, their levels don't drop. They don't require another, uh, another infusion. So that's actually really good for them if they're willing. And also, you know, if uh, any of you are having trouble getting patients into the infusion center and having roadblocks with getting them in on time and you want things to be done, done sooner, please take my cell phone and just reach out to me and I will have my office make sure they put them in within that week to see me and then we'll schedule for infusions within the next week. Thank you. I'll let me put my, go back up to the slide so everyone can have my contact information here because I actually really like text, uh, corresponding with text with everybody. So, so here's my email and here's my, I, I don't know if you, can you see it? And here's my cell phone. And Dr. DeSasa, there's two questions in the chat box um, after, after Steve's question. Okay. Um, let's see. Yes. So is, Okay, is iron absorption a concern in elderly? Um, I guess it could be a concern. I would say the bigger iron absorption problems happen in patients who have celiac disease, definitely patients who have bariatric surgery because that terminal ileum part you know, is not functioning properly or has been excised. Um, in elderly patients, some of them may have it, but it's not as big a concern as with uh, these other patient populations. But yeah, if you know they're elderly and they are compliant with the oral iron and it's not getting absorbed, definitely uh, we can default to IV iron. They're quick and easy treatments and it comes back up really quick. It's also less, it's not constipating or anything. It's well tolerated. But I think with the elderly too, I would try oral iron and only if it doesn't work, I would default to the IV. Um, okay. Um, what do you recommend for pure iron dosing administration for best absorption? Um, so we usually start with 325 milligrams once a day. Um, and the reason is that some of them, they get very, very constipated <laughs> and some people tolerate it really well and have no issues. Some other people get like, uh, GI symptoms, they may get like abdominal discomfort, some nausea. So we start slow with once a day. And I tell them usually if within a week you're tolerating it fine, um, then increase it to twice a day. And then I try to see them after a month or two to see where their levels are. And after that, if it's coming up, but still not at goal. Sometimes I'll ask them to take it three times a day. I also um, counsel them on constipation management. Um, you know, I tell them have a lot of uh, you know, a uh, high fiber diet, a lot of water, get over the counter stool softness, prune juice, just so that they can actively manage it and be aware uh, and not get to the point where it's really bad uh, so they can manage it from the beginning. Um, the next question is, please. Okay. Okay, that's from Jana, sorry. The evaluation. And then, okay, so for... For thrombocytosis, the question is, do you recommend that we always do a JAK2 mutation prior to sending to hematology? Um, that's a good question. So I think the answer to that is, you know, if there is um, other causes, and the big one being iron deficiency anemia in young women, uh, we will kind of do the consult and then decide whether or not that needs to be done. Because if there's really a leading cause causing it, uh, then sometimes we don't even have to do that for the patient. So I would say there's no need for you to order, just go ahead and send the patient to us. I think that's all the questions. Any other questions um, anybody would like to ask? Okay. So the next question is how do you manage thalassemia minor patients? Uh, with hemoglobin 9 to 10 and complaining of intermittent fatigue, conventionally told to avoid iron due to hemochromatosis risk? Um, so that's a good question. So with the levels of 9 to 10, we don't usually recommend transfusions. Thalassemia patients, 
unless and until the levels drop, we really just monitor them. Uh, for those levels, we don't transfuse them. Um, and yes, there is a concern with iron in these patients because their iron, it's, so one is either they're getting a lot of transfusions during their life, so they'll get iron deposited in their tissues and stuff like that, and they can have um, acquired hemochromatosis from that. And there's also um, a, 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 a different iron export mechanism for these patients with thalassemia minor, and they end up retaining a little more iron than a normal person would, even in the absence of transfusions. So I do uh, uh, that, so, so it is good to tell the patients to be mindful to not overdose on iron uh, in their diet and supplementation and things like that if it can be helped. Uh, and then the next question is, will a recording of the presentation and slides be sent out to the participants? So, I mean, I don't know if it was recorded, Rana. Yeah. But, oh yeah, you are recorded, Dr. Okay with it. <laughs> and I'm you're happy gonna to have it shared with whoever wants to uh, review it. Yeah, um, so uh, absolutely, there will be a recording. It'll go on our YouTube channel, expected in about a week. You'll also receive an email on the YouTube channel's Alameda Health Consortium's YouTube channel, and you'll find other CME recordings from there as well. And everyone who participated will also receive the slides as well. And um, just, I'm going to put up the evaluation link one more time. Just click it right now so you can complete it. <laughs> it enables you to get your certificate of attendance. Thank you so much, Dr. DeSalso. Let you say any last final words. We're so grateful to have you on here and to share all of your knowledge about this with us. So thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, enjoy doing the lecture and answering everybody's questions. Again, uh, this is my information. If you have any questions about the lecture or about patients, please feel free to email me here or reach out to me on my cell phone. Thank you so much.